in the last part we have studied what is bulk modulus what is elastic modulus what is shear modulus and we posed a question shear modulus is independent or not here in this part we will try to find out what is the relation between young's modulus e and shear modulus to do that let's consider this this element and let us mark our coordinate axis and let us define a stress state on this element in this fashion where sigma xx is a tensile stress acting on x plane and sigma yy is a compressive stress acting on y plane and i consider this sigma xx to be sigma and sigma yy to be minus sigma so i have given their magnitudes as sigma so we have dealt with this kind of situation when we discussed about some special conditions using mohr circle so here we are considering sigma yy to be minus sigma and sigma xx to be sigma now let's find out what are the strains developed for this element so let me do that so we find epsilon x s which is a normal strain along x direction so we can use this stress strain relations and find out what is epsilon x s so i get it uh, it as 1 upon e sigma x s minus mu into sigma y y because sigma z z 0 is 0 here so you end up in this relation and now i substitute these values which i have mentioned sigma x s to be sigma And sigma y y to be minus sigma, and I do that. When I do that, what I end up is epsilon x x to be sigma upon e into one plus mu. So we will end up in this. Now similarly, I can find out what is a strain, normal strain, which is developed along y direction when I apply sigma y y and sigma x x. So let's do that. So we have epsilon y y. Which comes out to be one upon e sigma y y minus mu sigma x x, and I similarly I put values of sigma y y and sigma x x, which in turn will yield you epsilon y y to be equal to minus sigma upon e into one plus mu. Now let's consider this strain which is developed along x axis to be epsilon. So what will be the strain along y direction? That is a normal strain along y direction. It will be Minus epsilon. Now let's look at this stress state in a using a Mohr circle and try to understand what is happening. So when we plot Mohr circle, what we do on x-axis we plot sigma and on y-axis we plot uh, shear stresses that is tau. Now if I want to represent this state stress state using Mohr circle, what I have to do is that I have to point. put normal stresses now this normal stresses where so here in this element there are no shear stresses i have just normal stresses so let's put sigma xx here so it will be a tensile stress so it will come on the positive side and sigma yy which is a compressive stress it will come on the negative side of uh, x axis and let us do that so i have sigma and sigma so the magnitude is same only the uh, directions are or the nature is changing so i have sigma sigma which i have plotted here and i can make a mohr circle and when i get a mohr circle i can find out what is a plane of maximum shear so you get a plane of maximum shear or tau max to be here at this located at this location and tau max you get the value to be sigma so what is the value of tau max tau max is a, a radius of mohr circle so the diameter of mohr circle here you can see that it should it is 2 sigma and radius must be sigma so tau max is equal to sigma we did this thing or we chose this deliberately chose this condition so as to get a plane where you don't have any normal stress so this is a plane this is a location of plane where there is no normal stresses and the coordinates of this Uh, point you can see that it is zero sigma so you don't have any normal stress and you just have only shear stress so this is a plane of maximum shear so let us mark this element which is present over here so this element uh, will have only shear stresses and no normal stresses so you mark the coordinate axis or uh, with respect to this element as to be x dash and y dash we wanted to have this plane where 
there is no normal stress present so as uh, we can write some uh, relations between stress and strain let's do that so here at this location the tau is equal to sigma that we have already figured it out and this is a state of pure shear so shear strain for this element we can write it as gamma dash x y equal to 1 upon g tau so we are considering this oriented reference axis which will be 45 degrees with with our x y coordinate axis standard reference axis so i can write a shear strain as to be gamma dash x y equal to 1 upon g tau and i can replace this tau by sigma so i can write this gamma dash x y which is nothing but shear strain uh, and i equate it with 1 upon g sigma so you get a value of gamma dash x y now let's move on and see the further analysis to find out the relationship between G and E. So you have a Mohr circle, we have plotted this Mohr circle. And similarly, we can plot Mohr circle for strain. So this is a Mohr circle for stress. We can plot Mohr circle for strain. So how to do that? So you plot normal strain along X axis and shear strain along y axis and the similar approach is used while plotting Mohr's circle for strain. So in our previous slide we have seen two strains that is epsilon xx to be equal to epsilon and epsilon yy to be equal to minus epsilon. So let's plot these two points that is epsilon and minus epsilon and we want to construct a Mohr circle for strain and we can do that and I plot a Mohr circle for strain. Why we are doing these things? Because we want to find out what is the strain at this location. We know what is the stress that is tau max at this location. Similarly, this plane will represent the same plane and I want to find out what is the strain at this location. So, at this location you have the strain that is epsilon dash xy. So this is a tensorial strain and this comes out to be epsilon dash xy and its magnitude must be epsilon. So you can see that it will be the radius of uh, this Mohr circle, the magnitude will be so epsilon dash xy is equal to epsilon. Now I can write this relation which we know earlier uh, between epsilon dash xy equal to gamma dash xy upon 2. We have seen this relation. The tensorial strain component and the relation between the shear strain component. So we can write that gamma dash xy equal to 1 upon g into sigma that we have seen from our previous slide. So that comes out to be gamma dash xy equal to 1 upon g sigma. And now I put this in this relation and I can that get that epsilon is equal to 1 upon 2g sigma. This is the relation we get. So there is another relation which we have looked uh, is epsilon xx is equal to sigma upon e 1 plus mu which is nothing but we equated it with epsilon and we can use this uh, relation now I have epsilon here which is representing this term and I have epsilon here which is representing this term so uh, in principle I can equate them so I get epsilon to be sigma upon e 1 plus mu and I equate these two terms and if you rearrange this what you get g that is a shear modulus is equal to e upon 2 into 1 plus mu so we get a relation between shear modulus and young's modulus now from here you can say that g is dependent on young's modulus and poisson's ratio so we have four elastic constants that those are e mu g and k so out of which g also be is dependent on e and mu and k is also dependent on e and mu we have seen this already so only two are independent that is e and mu so g is not independent constant only we have two independent constants those are e and mu the, those are for isotropic elastic materials now let's see we have seen these constants now uh, we want to find out what are the limits for this Poisson's ratio. So we can calculate the value of 
mu that is Poisson's ratio for two extreme cases. Which are these two extreme cases? The first case is when the volume remains constant, so it doesn't change. Volume remain, volume doesn't change, and the second is when there is no lateral contraction. So we have seen a relation between bulk modulus and elastic uh, modulus, that is Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. So we'll use that because that relates with the volume change. So we say that the extreme condition is that there is no volume change. Let's do that. So we have volumetric strain, that is delta V upon V, which is uh, related. This is one upon K into sigma. We have seen this relation, and now the extreme condition, the volume remains constant. That means volumetric strain becomes zero. That is, I equate this relation to zero. So the only possibility which I have is one minus two mu. Uh, one minus two mu must be equal to zero. So what you can do is that when I equate this one minus two mu equal to zero, you get mu equal to 0.5. And now the second case is g is equal to e upon two into one plus mu. So here g and e are positive for any materials g or shear modulus which relates uh, stress with strain. These quantities remains positive. So even g and e are positive, I can say that g upon e is greater than or equal to zero. So if I put this situation over here or this condition, if I uh, apply to this relation, what I get is that mu must be greater than or equal to minus one. So these are the two extreme cases which we have seen and we found out what are the values of mu. So mu that is a Poisson's ratio for isotropic elastic materials must lie between 0.5 and minus 1. So these are two extremes of values for Poisson's ratio. So there are materials I have listed over here and their corresponding Poisson's ratio. So for most of the metals and alloys the Poisson's ratio lie between 0.2 to 0.3 or 0.4 or for most of the metals they are between 0.2 to 0.3. For if the Poisson's ratio is 0.5 or reaches to 0.5, that becomes an incompressible material. So let me write it down. So when Poisson's ratio is exactly equal to 0.5, that is an incompressible material, incompressible elastic. Isotropic material. So you reach, you hardly reach Poisson ratio to be 0.5. Rubber has reached to 0.499, and you can see another extreme here where cork shows Poisson ratio to be zero. That means, so when Poisson ratio is zero, that means, uh, let me write it down. So when when I say here, so I defined it as Poisson ratio to be epsilon 3 3 upon epsilon 1 1. So lateral strain upon longitudinal strain. So Poisson ratio when it becomes zero, that means you don't have any lateral strain which is developed uh, when when I'm trying to deform my material in one direction. That is what it means. So cork doesn't show a lateral strain uh, when when you try to deform it. So with this, I will put a question on to you. There are materials which shows a negative Poisson's ratio that is those materials are called as oxytic materials so you can google about what is what are oxytic materials how they behave why they show negative Poisson's ratio let me write it down here so for these materials you have Poisson's ratios to be negative just uh, for curiosity you just check what are oxytic materials so here is an interesting article the title is Poisson's ratio at 200 so this article came in Nature Materials, which is a very reputed journal, which publishes a very high quality research in material science. And this article came sometimes back in 2011, because that year, 2011, bicentenary year for celebrating Poisson's ratio. So this Poisson's ratio was first proposed in 1811, and the, it was published in Traité de Mécanique by Simon Denis Poisson. And here he is 
So in this article, you can find out many interesting insights into materials, new materials such as amorphous materials, liquid crystals, liquids itself. You can understand the how liquid behaves at near melting point and very exotic materials such as oxetic materials which shows negative bosons ratio all these interesting things you can find it over here and in this article so if you are interested you can check check this article out